Rennie Curran joining us now, linebacker, All-American at the University of Georgia. All-American as a freshman, Rennie. Uh, you're from here, Brookwood High School, but let's talk about your freshman year. All-American as a freshman. What was that like for you? Man, it was a really crazy experience just getting to the University of Georgia. First and foremost, I get there, I'm labeled as an undersized linebacker, not expected to really even play in the SEC, let alone at University of Georgia. And I'm just happy to be there, man. I get there and you got Thomas Brown, No Sean Marino, um, so many guys that I looked up to. And the first thing for me was just really earning the coach's trust and just uh, really convincing myself that I could even be on this team and I could even be a contributor. And just going from that to learning, I mean, spending so many weeks and weeks by myself, getting in the weight room, getting in the film room, um, building up that confidence, watching guys like Tony Taylor, Odell Thurman, Thomas Davis, guys who came before me, and just really being a sponge. That was a lot, a, a lot of what uh, helped me to get to where I was in that freshman year. You know, but you're coming out of high school, you know, recruiting's got all these stars. You were a four-star prospect out of Brookwood, so yeah. they expected you to show up and be the, one of the guys, right? Oh, yeah, without a doubt, man. I was blessed to come out of Brookwood High School, out of Snellville, amazing community great coaches, great teachers, just great overall environment. And so that really prepared me, you know, to be at the, the level of University of Georgia. Got uh, used to playing in some big games, Brooklyn Parkview, um, you know, just so many experiences that really helped me to where I got there. When I got to the University of Georgia, it wasn't such a big transition. And so, yeah. Let's talk about that, you know, high school rivalries. You know, mm -hmm. in Georgia, high school rivalries are big. Friday nights are huge. Yeah, yeah. And the Big Orange Jungle, Parkview, you know, we, we know Jeff Francoeur, former Brave, of course. He was a longtime Parkview when those guys won 51 games in a row. But just talk about high school Friday nights for you and Brookwood around the area. Yeah, I mean, I can't say it enough about how intense, uh, how much everything meant uh, playing high school football in Georgia. I mean, you got Brookwood Parkview, you got, we, we went down to Lowndes one year, got destroyed. So you got <laughs> that down south southern football. I mean, just, uh, there's so much talent. You know, when I came out, we had guys like Eric Berry, we had Jonathan Dwyer. We had so many great players that went on to play in the league. Alan Bailey, um, Morgan Burnett. Uh, but just, like I said, playing in, the, in Georgia, top classification. It was 5A at that time. Now it's 7A. Uh, it really, really does prepare you for that next level of wherever you might play in uh, college football. And sometimes it might even be a drop-off just because of the environment and the programs that you're able to play in from the weight room to the academics and everything else. You know, but really, Brookwood, I'm going to give you all a plug because that's a, a great yeah. community over there. Mark Cruz was your coach, and uh, just Coach Cruz and the whole Brookwood yeah. community, it's still going strong, isn't it? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Now, Philip Jones is the current head coach there, but, yeah, Coach Mark Cruz, Dave Hunter, can't go without mentioning him. Oh, no. Uh, they set such a strong foundation um, for just building a quality program, a program that just thrives off excellence, not only on the field but off the field as well. There's so many guys that came through that program that are now better men because of what they went through while at Brookwood and Gwinnett County as a whole is, is special. I was just there recently speaking to the athletic directors and whatnot, and I'm just proud to be from there, man. So many great, um, just talented athletes, talented people as well come out of Gwinnett County. Yeah, that's something I found. Like when I, when I talk to pros, whether it's baseball, football, or whatever, yeah. you get in the locker room and you want to talk high school, yeah. guys are ready, man. <laughs> They're ready and they remember almost every play of their big rivalry games and the big state championship games and different things, don't they? Oh yeah, it, it, one, of those things, one of those things that's timeless, you know, uh, no matter what level you go to, uh, if you're on an NFL team and, you know, you got some Georgia guys on there, we're, we're always constantly talking about Friday nights, who's winning, who's losing, we're putting money up on the games, you know, probably shouldn't say that, but no. <laughs> it, it happens though, I mean, there's just a lot of pride when it comes to your high school and uh, just representing and, and making sure that after you leave, that legacy continues on. But you, you know, you're a Georgia guy, what was it like playing for the lore? and the, the history of the University of Georgia. I mean, when you run out of the tunnel, what was it like for you as a young freshman, 18 years old, you run out of the tunnel and you hear that noise for the first time? Man, it, it was special. It really, really was. I remember uh, being 10 years old after Little League football games, getting in my Little League coach's car because he would pick me up almost every day for practice because my parents were working uh, all the time. And I would crank up the radio and listen to Larry Munson and Still remember the first time I went to the stadium at, at around that same age, 10, 11 years old, getting my first experience tailgating, uh, learning the, the cheer at the kickoff. Uh, all those memories, man, watching David Pollock, David Green, who were from Snellville as well, and just dreaming and imagining. And, and for it to actually come to life as a result of so many people who poured into me, man, it was, it was overwhelming. It was humbling. 
And uh, it just meant so much to me. Every play, every down meant so much because I always remember being that young kid who wanted to change things, who maybe saw a game that we lost and was like, man, if I could have just been out on the field. And so every play mattered that much more because I had the opportunity to change things. You touched on this briefly, but what was it like for you when you came in? Because you are an undersized linebacker, and I'm sure you heard that ad nauseum, but oh, what is that like? <laughs> you know, how does that fuel your fire and, and make you overcome things? Man, it, it really challenged me to always keep a chip on my shoulder and to never get comfortable no matter how much success that I had. I was always thinking about how can I improve just a little bit more, even if I was, you know, SEC player of the week or whatever it was, I was just looking at, you know, how can I become the best version of myself and maximize everything, not only on the field, but off the field as well. And, you know, every time somebody would, would laugh, I remember the first couple of times I got on the field, the offensive lineman, you, they pretty much looked at me and laughed and like, <laughs> seriously? <laughs> and uh, it just, you know, challenged me even more. And it, it's something that still sticks with me to this day to always try to become the best version of myself, always try to overcome the odds, no matter how far it's stacked up against me. One of the biggest awards for a linebacker is the Butkus Award. You were a finalist for that award. Are you familiar with number 51, Dick Butkus? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Have you seen video of him? Yeah, I mean, once <laughs> he, I... He's a wrecker, man. He wrecks people. Definitely. I mean, those guys, him, Mike Singletary, uh, you can't be a football fan. You can't be a linebacker and not know those names. You know, and Buckus is definitely one of them. And so to even have my name mentioned in there, man, was once again just humbling. It, it was just a, a testament to the hard work. And not only that, my teammates. I had the opportunity to play behind guys like Geno Atkins, you know, Brandon Wood. I mean, so many great, uh, Justin Houston, so many yeah. great defensive linemen. I can't take the credit for everything. Defensive though. linemen help a linebacker. Oh, Don't they? Yeah. That's a linebacker's best friend, man. Exactly. Big it's, defensive lineman in front of you. Yeah, it's like a quarterback's, uh, you know, offensive lineman. Right. You know, he's not going to be successful. Running back's not going to be successful without a, a tough offensive line that, that covers their back. And so it's the same thing for me with my defensive linemen. So I got a lot of guys to thank for any award, any accolades that I got. What made the college football experience for you? I mean, what made it the most hmm. fun and, and enriching for you? Man, the biggest thing that uh, made it fun and inspiring and, and just worth it for me was definitely the relationships that I built. Uh, relationships with teammates, relationships with coaches, relationships with the fans. Um, all those experiences now, man, it's like I go back to University of Georgia and those relationships are still intact. And I'm able to now as an entrepreneur travel around the state and from those experiences and the hard work that I put in at University of Georgia, it's like now I can capitalize on those relationships and, and everything that was built. So that's probably the most special part and, and something that uh, has impacted my entire life. You know, something I found interesting is that you play three different instruments, right? I mean, you play the, what do you play? The drums, yeah. the piano, and yeah. the viola, yeah. which is a bigger mm -hmm. version of the violin you were telling me, right? Yeah, so uh, music was definitely a big part of my life and that's what most people don't know about me, but. Uh, with my parents being immigrants and not knowing anything about football, that, that wasn't their first move like most parents. It was to get me into to music or to get me uh, exposed to, you know, different things that I normally wouldn't be exposed to. And so my mom, I was a, a knucklehead of a kid. I was the only, <laughs> I'm the only boy, uh, youngest of three, two older sisters and everything. So she wanted a way to calm me down. So first thing she did was got me piano lessons uh, after enrolling me in the Boys and Girls Club. Then uh, got playing the drums at church. And then from there, once we moved to Gwinnett County, uh, I actually joined the orchestra in the sixth, sixth grade. So that's wow. when I started playing the viola. And so uh, my sister actually played it first and she didn't stick with it. So I wanted to join the band, but we couldn't afford a clarinet or anything like that. So she already had the viola. So I just picked that up and uh, ran with it and, and played until my junior year of high school. You know, talked about that, your parents coming over because they were immigrants, right? You all had to come over, yeah. find a place, you know, and, and kind of make your way. And they kind of worked hard to make their your way, you know, to make their way to help you. Yeah, uh, I can't say enough about my parents and just how much they sacrificed. You know, every time I think about their journey, I'm just blown away. Uh, my mom came here around the age of 30 years old on scholarship to Emory to get her master's in nursing. Came here with $10 in her pocket, didn't know her way around had a thick accent that nobody could understand <laughs> and uh, stayed here for, you know, until she got her master's. And then my dad came over once she was finished with my oldest sister, who was about eight years old at the time. And he just uh, came here, did not know his way around either. From Liberia, Yeah, right? from Liberia, yeah. Just stayed in the house basically for a year. One of his friends was in shoe repair. And so he was the first one to get him out of the house and kind of train him. And he ended up buying into a shoe repair franchise, but worked 12 hours a day out in Kennesaw. Uh, and just, you know, humble 
hardworking, respectful, honest people, man. So I can't say enough about how many uh, sacrifices that they made to help me. And it, it wasn't like they just built themselves. They helped so many of our family members uh, because at this time there was a civil war going on in their home country, Liberia. So everything that I saw them do, it just spoke volumes of their character. And it, it was something that was instilled in me, something that they didn't have to say, but that they lived. You know, there is something, isn't it, about that generation? I mean, they, yeah. they help people from where they are because there are a lot of immigrants that come over and they all seem to stick together, which is great because they need that. They need each other. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. It, it's, it's a very uh, special just experience when you look at the, the immigrant who comes to, to a new uh, land. You know, I think about now, if I was 30, yeah, right. I'm 30 years old now, if I were to just pick up and go to Asia or, you know, to Europe and just completely start over from scratch, not knowing my way around how tough that would be. And so when I look at them and just what they were able to do, I'm just amazed. And it really um, puts me in a position where I have no excuse. I have no excuse but to succeed. And so that's what drives me uh, so much day in and day out is just knowing what they've overcome and knowing that I have to carry on that torch and, and carry on that legacy. Let's talk about your life after football. You've written a few books, done some other things. Talk about writing a book. What inspired you to do that? Man, so it, it's a long story, always is. <laughs> That's okay. But uh, basically, when it came to me writing my first book, it was one of the toughest times of my life. I had uh, gotten drafted, of course, to the Tennessee Titans in 2010, but not too long after that, the lockout happened. Uh, coaching staff got fired, Jeff Fisher and his guys. New staff comes in, and in 2011, uh, they drafted new linebackers and whatnot. I ended up cut back home for about six months. And so throughout the course of this time, I'm looking at how can I maximize this experience. I started working on myself, started reading a ton of books, from everything from Malcolm Gladwell to Napoleon Hill to you know, anything I could get my hands on. And at that moment, I got inspired to write something that would help people who were in the same position that I was in. You know, People who maybe came out of college, didn't get the, the job right away or lost their business like my father or lost their job or went through divorce. And so my first book really talks about, it's called Free Agent. And it uses free agent as a metaphor to talk about how we all get to a time of uncertainty, how we all get to a time where we basically are free agents in life and trying to find, um, you know, our next move in a, in a place of transition. So that's that's how I got started. Yeah, but you also have some children's books. I know that. I remember you came in and showed me some of those children. Those are yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. Tell yeah. us about that. What inspired that? Yeah, so uh, that was one of those things that was inspired just uh, by God, really. It, it came to me in the middle of the night, and I thought about, how so many times, um, you know, I go to speak because at that time I had built my speaking business. I was still trying to play uh, and uh, kind of getting towards the tail end of my career. But I travel around in so many schools and I see so many kids who are down on themselves, who lack that confidence, who are going through so much in life. And so when it came to that book, you know, I really wanted to write something that just inspires them to not only achieve to be great in terms of their position or their status, but also as a person but who they are. You know, I have a little girl as well. She's 11 years old now. And so I wanted her to also get that experience of what it would be like to become an author. So I actually uh, invited her to, to write it with me. So we wrote that book together. And uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it, it was what awesome. What was that experience. experience like? Tell us about that. Man, it, it was special. You know, every time she would um, spend, we would spend time together, she would always, you know, leave papers on the floor with different drawings and different things she was writing. She has a wild imagination. So as I was putting together the book, um, you know, I looked over at her and she was doing the same thing she usually does, which is drawing and writing. And I was like, hey, come over here. And I was like, you know, dad's writing a book. Would you like to be an author? What do you think about that? And she was just like, of course, yeah. Um, and she didn't know what she was getting herself into. But as we put it together and, and, you know, started to go out to the elementary schools and I gave her the opportunity to speak, she just fell in love with the process, man. And it was cool just to show her that she can have an idea and she can, you know, create something that inspires people, even at that age, that young age. Did she use, did you use some of those drawings that, that she did? No, I didn't. Pictures? <laughs> See, then I, I used it for inspiration. And, uh, you know, I got a lot of her ideas, really tried to get into the psychology of a child. And so I asked her and she really helped, you know, when it came to putting together the book. And I had a buddy of mine, luckily, because both of us aren't, weren't given the talent of drawing, but I had a buddy of mine who was a professional uh, artist, Dylan Ross. And so he was able to, to create a lot of those pictures for us. Now you're building your brand. Tell us what you do now. You speak, you do different things. Tell us about it. Yeah, so the bread and butter of what I do now is the keynote speeches and the training workshops. So I travel around the nation speaking to schools, businesses, and associations on leadership, team building, um, mindset, 
diversity and inclusion, a lot of different topics. And a lot of it is what I draw from the game of football. Uh, you know, all my experiences there, the principles that I learned. And so it's been great. I've got partnerships with uh, John Gordon, uh, also with an organization called Rise that empowers athletes to uh, basically leverage their jerseys to be influencers and to be leaders in the community. Uh, but it's been great, man. And, and now I'm in a position where I'm trying to take all the experiences and really help uh, whether it's athletes, business leaders to do kind of the same thing, leverage their experiences to uh, be influencers, whether it's through public speaking or through writing a book. You know, as a, as a college athlete, that scholarship, how much did it mean to you mm. to have that scholarship to go to school? Man, it, it meant a lot. Uh, just having that scholarship, I mean, at the same time, you realize you have to earn it. You know, that's one thing. You get there and you put in so much time, so much work, so much effort between balancing on the field and off the field life. But without a doubt, I mean, that, that scholarship to be able to not uh, worry about the debt um, that comes with education, because we all know the cost of yeah. education right now, to have that load lifted uh, and be able to earn it in a different way is, is huge. And now as a man, you know, now that I've graduated, got my business degree, I can walk basically into any company that has dogs, and most of them do in the state of Georgia, and uh, have a leg up, you know, just by the fact that I have that G. You know, because a, a lot of people, I mean, you know, they talk about, sure, I mean, the, the schools get the most out of athletes, but you, right. you used what they gave you. Right. And, and I mean, I think more guys need to do that, don't you? I mean, because that's a gift. I mean, that's right. an unbelievable gift. Like the thing that you just said, you know, I was able to graduate without student debt. Right, right. I mean, that's, that's big. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, there's, there's unfortunately guys who go through the, you know, the experience of being a student athlete and don't fully take advantage of that. And what I mean by that is, is not, I feel like it's not just enough to get your degree. Um, building relationships, leveraging your brand, building a brand that ex extends far beyond the game of, of football or whatever sport you may play is, is crucial because as athletes, I mean, we got an expiration date and yeah. every single day that window of opportunity is closing. So whether you're doing interviews, you know, whether you're, you're on social media, there's so many different ways that you can leverage, you know, that opportunity beyond just getting the scholarship. And I, I feel like if that's all you come away with, then you've really kind of missed out on a major opportunity. What are your thoughts? You know, I mean, I know you went through the war, so you, mm -hmm. you got beat up a little bit. The injuries, the, the head injuries especially, what are your thoughts on all the, the concussion and the protocol that's going on now? Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely, uh, without a doubt, something serious that players really have to keep account on. And the more and more players get bigger, faster, stronger, uh, the tougher that they're going to need to be on it in, in, in terms of increasing uh, the level of equipment that they provide, the technology, the research. Uh, all those things are so important because we're, we're so young. And when you're bashing your head and you're playing linebacker like myself and you're a human torpedo, Essentially, <laughs> you, you, don't, you leave your feet, right? Yeah, I mean, I would throw my body at folks, uh, and I had to. If it's a 6'6", 300-pound offensive lineman, um, and at 22, you don't really think about it from, you know, from that 18 to 22, 23 years old. But as you progress, 26, 27 years old, your joints start to feel it, your, your mind, everything starts to be affected, especially as you push up in age. So it's, it's a very, very uh, important topic uh, that, that players have to, you know, take serious and everybody involved as well because there has to be accountability. All right, Rennie, well, how can folks reach you if they want to get in touch with you? So the best way to reach me is through my website and that's just renniecurrent.com and then also through social media. I'm very active on there, LinkedIn, Instagram. Uh, most of it's at, just at Rennie Curran. So that's the biggest way. And uh, yeah, love getting in touch with people, love staying connected to the Bulldog Nation. And uh, of course, my folks at Brookwood as well. All right, hey, Rennie, thanks so much for being on with us. I appreciate it, man. Yes, sir, thank you.